Welcome to this episode of the GEO interview. My name is Anmol and today we're hosting Mr. Kevin McCall, who is the Managing Director of the UK India Business Council in London. Today, he is here to talk to us about the trade dynamics between India and the UK. To tell you a bit more about Kevin, in his previous endeavors, he has had a long association with the UK Diplomatic Service and has served various postings across Europe as well as in India when he was posted at the British Deputy High Commission in Kolkata. Kevin, it is an honor to have you with us. How are you doing today? Excuse me, Anmo. Yeah, no, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's lovely to see you. Um, uh, and it's lovely to be indoors because it's a horrible, grey, rainy day here in London. Oh, very well. Glad to hear that, Kevin. I'm very excited about the conversation that is going to follow. Uh, so before we dive right off into the relations between India and UK, I would like to start off this conversation by asking you about a brief overview of your journey uh, into the UK diplomatic service to your current role at the UK India Business Council. And in that, I am particularly interested about how the experiences that you've had till now have shaped your perspective on going on to promote relations between India and the UK, uh, particularly in terms of trade. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Anmol. So, yeah, as you said in that sort of nice introduction you gave me, I was in the British Diplomatic Service, um, there for 19 years, and I had postings in London, the Netherlands, Malta, Romania, and then in 2005, I was posted to Kolkata, and I had three years there. Now, I really enjoyed my time in the working in the Foreign Office. I met and worked with lots of really amazing people and had some wonderful experiences living in different countries, different exposure, and learned a huge amount. Um, but when it came to planning what I was going to do after finishing in Kolkata in 2008, I decided I wanted to remain engaged with India. You know, even... So then in sort of the mid-2000s, India uh, was rising in significance, both economically and geopolitically. You know, it was clear that India, along with China, was going to be one of the most important countries as we go through the 21st century. Um, so I wanted to remain engaged with that. Um, I found it fascinating. I had lots of great friends and great contacts. So I wanted to so keep involved with India. So that opportunity to joined the UK India Business Council back in 2008. It, that was one I just I jumped at. Um, I, I just wanted to keep involved with India and be part of that UK India um, bilateral relationship. Now, that was, when did I start in Calcutta? Calcutta was 2005, so 19 years ago. So I've been doing this for nearly 20 years now. And that experience that longevity has helped me to keep a focus on the long-term trajectory in the relationship and to, to plan ahead. You know, you asked about how my experience is helping me shape how I think about trade and investment between the UK. And it's that kind of a long term, because over 20 years, you see ups and downs. Um, or kind of the, the, the trend is always upwards, but there are dips and there are a sense. So it's always important to look at that that longer term trajectory. You know, things rarely change overnight. Economic and social development uh, are, 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 are part of a journey. So I always encourage businesses to always look forward and to reassess what they've learned or perceived in the past. So always look forward. And I always encourage not just businesses, but those observing the UK into relationship, whether it's politicians or journalists, to keep focused on that big picture and the long-term nature of the relationship. There will be short-term bumps, um, but they don't matter in the long term. Um, those bumps could be you know, a couple of quarters of slow economic growth or an unhelpful comment by a politician. You know, These things make great headlines in short-term you know, talking points, but they don't actually change the fundamentals of India's economic and social and geopolitical rise or fundamental nature of the UK-India relationship or of the opportunities for both of the countries. So, 
you know that's something that's always important to keep keep in mind and thankfully in my experience most companies focus on future commercial opportunities so uk companies see the myriad opportunities in india and likewise indian companies see the the myriad opportunities of collaborating in the uk as well but that's not to say those short-term bumps and short-term changes in perception don't matter so for example uh, when if the uk and the fta is completed the 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 the, the news around that and the communication strategy the governments will have around that will create much more awareness and positivity about the opportunities and that will encourage more smes and more young people to look at those opportunities other things that create um positive perceptions and drive engagement are prime ministerial visits so you know we, we've seen bumps in interest in india when mr modi came to london in 2015 and then again in 2018 and bringing businesses from both countries together to meet prime ministers those things again create that sense of opportunity engagement and, and dynamism and we we, we had pre-pandemic a uh, uk india ceo forum and that had 20 indian ceos 20 british ceos meeting with both prime ministers and that met three or four times between 2015 and the, the start of the pandemic. So I think these things matter. So um, bringing the um, prime ministers together, bringing businesses together with them, those things change perceptions, those things stimulate and encourage young people and SMEs to, to look at um, India and to look at the UK. So um, while I say the long-term trend always matters, these little PR boosts, this little bit of awareness raising, that always helps just to stimulate new interest and new entrance into the, the bilateral relationship. Uh, it is so interesting to hear how uh, back in 2008, you were able to foresee uh, India's uh, rise of significance and its growing role in geopolitics and how economics can like go up and down in like a single night. But yes, thank you so much for taking us through your journey. It is very intriguing to know more about how you have such a wide range of experiences under your belt. Uh, to build on from here with the understanding that uh, you're very closely involved with government bodies and top businesses in both India and the UK. And as you mentioned, that too at a time when the two countries have a free trade agreement under the works. Uh, could you share some insights into the underlying significance of this trade agreement? how it reflects and fulfills the priorities of the two nations and uh, how do you foresee this agreement going on to shape uh, future trade relations between the two nations? Okay, that's an interesting question, Anmol. So let me try and pick up each of those, those elements. So um, I think first it's important to say that um, even without the FTA, UK and their trade is, is growing. Um, if you look at the bilateral trade in 2013, so going back 10 years, the bilateral trade then was £16.5 billion. In 2023, it risen to £38 billion. And that figure in 2023 was actually a over 30% jump on the 2022 figure. So the FTA, um, even without the FTA, there's still that, that growth in the UK-India trade relationship. But the FTA will make, will make a difference. As I said earlier, it will create some noise, it will create buzz about the opportunities, and that will attract more companies into the trade and investment relationship. UK companies that are looking at India see that there's a growing opportunity there. They, they realise that India, I think by 2028, will become the third biggest economy, third biggest consumer economy in the world. But they also sense or have an understanding that it's a tough market to enter. So they're looking at the FTA and thinking, right, this is a great opportunity in India, a growing opportunity, but it's tough to enter. Could this FTA make it easier to enter, make it easier for us to go and invest in India? So I think the, the FTA will 
um, create that confidence in British businesses to go and invest in India because the opportunities become easier to access. The, in, in terms of priorities, I think we have to realise that it's hard to pick out priorities because we've got the world's fifth biggest economy, India, and the UK, the world's sixth biggest economy, negotiating a free trade agreement here. So um, two massive and diverse economies. So there's going to be lots of opportunities. So picking out one or two priorities um, is, is, not, is not easy. Um, saying that, I think it's important to realise that the UK economy is heavily services orientated. So the UK will want to support its services sectors to move into India. Um, at the same time, the UK government wants to grow UK manufacturing and goods as well. So um, commonly reported that um, Scotch whiskey, food and drink and uh, automotive are areas where um, the UK would like to see lower tariffs so more UK goods can enter. India. Thinking about India into the UK, you know, India also a strong services economy, and that's what has been driving largely the the growth of Indian exports to the UK. It's been its amazing services sector. But I think there are tremendous opportunities for India to gain improved access to the UK for many good services, for example, textiles, leather products, and India's food and drink and its agri products. And as these sectors employ tens and hundreds of thousands of middle and low income Indians, I think there's a real opportunity through this FTA to spur growth in those sectors in India that will create tens of thousands of jobs for those low and middle income Indians um, through increased exports to the UK. So broad opportunities because they're two massive economies, but I think there are a few sort of areas where the governments do want to you know, create additional value for, for their own industries. It is again so intriguing to hear how the two countries have such varying interests and uh, they have such diverse economic landscapes, but through this FDA, they are trying to integrate these two economies and like build up for the future. Uh, so again, coming from a position like yours, from where you've possibly witnessed and have a deep understanding of how governments and businesses uh, get affected by what goes on around the world. Uh, what are some of the major challenges that governments and businesses in India and the UK are facing uh, in today's rapidly evolving uh, global trade environment? And how can policymakers and business leaders come together, together to address these challenges and create an environment that promotes growth? Okay, question, and I'll give it a I'll, I'll give it a shot. Now, I think while, while there will always be goods that will be traded between the UK and India, traveling on cargo ships and, and airplanes, I think that most of the, the growth in bilateral trade will be in digitally delivered and IP-rich services and know-how. Um, that's where I think the, the bulk of the growth will be in the future. And... In that case, it's really important that things like data protection, regulations, IP protection, and how cross-border digital services are taxed and where they, where they will be taxed will be important. And it's fiendishly complicated to do that, and it will require sort of great minds to, to solve those, those challenges. And to an extent, some of these things can be considered bilaterally between the UK and India. So finding complementary uh, and a complementary regulations, equivalent regulations in, say, the data protection regimes. But it's important to understand the UK and India are not operating in a, a two-country bubble, the, that these issues are, are multilateral. What the UK agrees with India um, will impact what the UK or India agree with the EU or with the US or with ASEAN. So... These things are, are, are quite um, complex and will require G20, OECD and others to, um, to help land on solutions. But I think the trade elements in digital services 
are sort of going to be sort of increasingly vital. So trying to find solutions there will unlock massive growth in the future. I think you've very rightly said that uh, India and UK are not uh, operating in a two country bubble and there are a lot of aspects involved. Uh, other countries, uh, regional blocs and international organizations as well. Uh, so linking with this and uh, with the last, last point as well, uh, and considering the role of geopolitics in the conversation, uh, particularly recent developments such as the rise of AI, uh, Brexit, and the recent shift of spotlight to the Indo-Pacific region, mm. where India is a major player. How do you envision these factors influencing aspects of trade between India and the UK? And how can governments and businesses uh, adopt to these and navigate these geopolitical complexities? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so looking back over the last sort of three or four years, say, so with the COVID lockdowns, the war in Ukraine, and now in the Middle East, these have all led to significant disruption in, in trade flows and investment patterns as well. And you know, geopolitics has risen, I think, to the top of most companies' risk registers. Uh, and I think that's sort of these factors have led to two interrelated developments. Um, thinking back over the last three, four years, we've had COVID lockdowns um, to varying degrees around the world, but China's was a particularly robust lockdown. Uh, then we've had the war in Ukraine and now in the Middle East. Uh, these things have certainly uh, impacted uh, business leaders' strategies, these geopolitical changes. And you know, I'm, uh, from what I've been reading recently, geopolitics, political risk have move to the top of the risk registers of many um, of the major companies around the world. And I think that's led to two interconnected developments. So the first aspect of that is a de-risking with manufacturers diversifying their sourcing strategies. Those companies that were mainly or totally dependent on China have set up their own facilities in other countries or have partnered with suppliers in other countries. And we've seen UK companies do that, including SMEs that were, you know, making in China and taking that China made product and their supply chains. They've now opened up and expanded into India rather than expand within China. So that's that's something we've seen even from SMEs, not just the, the majors. The second of those interrelated developments is that shift to regional and probably more resilient supply chains rather than spread global supply chains. And we're increasingly hearing phrases like reshoring, so bringing production back to the home country, or nearshoring, bringing production to the same region, uh, and friend shoring, you know, investing in countries that are seen as more politically and culturally attuned and less politically risky. And I think that the thing about friends showing, I think the UK and India are friends. So UK companies feel India is a low risk geopolitically. But they also see India as an opportunity. And there's different layers to that opportunity. One is that by investing and setting up operations in India, they can access brilliant talent. So you know, highly skilled staff. They also see that by investing in India, they can uh, enhance their R&D capability, their ability to innovate. And the third of the four layers um, is that they're, if they're making in India, they're, they're, they're already at the heart of that growing Indian economy. So it's easier to sell into to India. But going back to your Asia Pacific point, if UK companies are in India, making in India, then they're really close to that regional hub. So India could be part of their uh, Southeast Asia or their Asia Pacific um, market access strategy. So I think that you're right, geopolitics has changed business strategies. And what we're seeing is that 
India is becoming an increasingly um, important part of UK companies' Asia strategies. It's not just the UK government that's taking an Indo-Pacific tilt, it's UK businesses as well that are taking that tilt. And India is very much seen as the gateway to the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, based on the two factors that you mentioned, de-risking and how uh, the UK government and businesses are tilting towards the Indo-Pacific, I think this is the right point to mention uh, the significance of coordinated and proactive action uh, to strive in today's complex and dynamic geo landscape. Uh, so moving on from here and shifting a focus, shifting the focus towards the growing role of youth in the conversation that we have mm. building up here, what is your take on how organizations and startups, particularly youth-led ones, uh, can play a prominent role in driving innovation and fostering partnerships, uh, for example, in emerging areas such as AI, as you mentioned, and if that can eventually go on to promote deeper trade relations? No, excellent question. And the in many ways, the you know the, the the opportunities are you know available to people no matter how young or old they are um and as someone who's not um a, a youth anymore i hate to say it but the you know the, the the ideas the innovation and sort of fresh thinking is coming from young people it's the young people that will be innovating and creating the future so I think there's a, an incredibly important role there for uh, young people to do that. But I think young people need um, support and encouragement and stimulus to, to help them achieve that. There so it strikes me that there's something like 160,000 young Indians studying in the UK. And I imagine that amongst those 160,000, there are thousands of maybe existing entrepreneurs, but certainly budding entrepreneurs. So, you know, um, could programs be developed um, where, say, the UK and Indian governments, backed by industry, VC fund, angel investors, or maybe even academic institutions themselves, could, could they come together to create a fund that provides seed capital to university spin-offs that are co-founded by British and Indian students here in the UK. Um, this, I think, would not only incentivize and enable young entrepreneurs to get that sort of first business off the ground, to have their first launch, but it would really embed UK-India collaboration right at the start of entrepreneurial careers. And if those... British and Indian entrepreneurs are still within that academic ecosystem, then they're able to kind of a benefit from all of that other knowledge that's around there. And if they've got that funding, that's one way of really, you know, getting fresh businesses off the ground. And the UK and Indian co-founders can then use their networks in both countries. So you've got a business that's born Indo-British or UK Indian right at its genesis and i think that um could be really exciting to see those businesses launch and then grow and and flourish in the future i think you've given us a very nice understanding of how the youth can play a prominent role in knowledge exchange and partnerships uh, which can eventually go on to promote a deeper understanding of emerging things and can give rise to new ideas as well uh, so if we view this in a formal context, considering uh, you've had a long stint with the UK civil service, uh, are there any specific policy measures that you can think of uh, that governments can uh, implement to create a more conducive regulatory environment in particular uh, that encourages entrepreneurship and global partnership? Now, beyond that, Previous point I made about trying to sort of um, create a, a you know a seed capital fund could could governments play a role there? Um, I wonder if 
Again, are, are there possible tax incentives that can be put in place? Some tax breaks for startups founded by people under the age of thirty. I don't know what 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 um, counts as youth, and um, we may have different perspectives on it. I think young people are under the age of forty. You may think it's under the age of twenty five. Um, but you know, could there be tax breaks given for you know, young um, startups um, launched by um, young people? But more generally, the incentives and the business environment that are created by governments will benefit young entrepreneurs as well as more mature entrepreneurs as well. So um, something that creates, gives them access to seed funding and something that gives some tax breaks. I think those are, are, are two things that are worth considering. I believe that uh, with this, we've covered a very good length and breadth of themes that have gone on mm. to uh, give us insights into a lot of uh, crucial aspects uh, that can influence the youth and, and, and the trade relations between UK and India as well. Uh, so to bring this to a final note, are there any recommendations that you would like to offer to uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, policymakers, and business leaders to encourage them to collaborate rise up and make the most of emerging opportunities in the years to come. Okay, yes. Now let's, um, it's a really important question and one that I think can be tremendously beneficial for the UK, India, and indeed the wider world. And as well as those stakeholders, you, you mentioned businesses, governments, young people, um, I'd throw in education institutions as well, sort of building on sort of our, our discussion of a moment ago. You know, we've already seen the incredible impact of the COVID vaccine that was developed and distributed worldwide through that partnership with Oxford University, AstraZeneca, and the Serum Institute of, of India. And Oxford and the Serum Institute have also worked on a, a malaria vaccine as well. And I think there are many, many more less well-known research initiatives involving UK universities, students at UK universities and Indian industry and Indian institutions. So for instance, there are um, two Indian PhD students at Glasgow University are working on a project for Apollo tires to reduce the waste and energy consumption in their manufacturing processes. So that's just sort of one example of many. In, in the UK, IBC, we're going to publish a report later this year that captures a wide range of these types of projects. And they're, they're going to cover climate change and sustainability, food security, and uh, other, other healthcare projects as well. So I think if UK industry, Indian industry, Academia on both sides and students in both countries could kind of come together and work on these other global game changers like the COVID vaccine. I think that would be tremendously important. There's tremendous potential to do that. And that would benefit the UK, it would benefit India, but it would also develop people around the world, particularly in developing countries. And as we've seen through 2023 and before that, you know, India is playing a leading role in engaging with the global south. You know, through the G20 presidency, it got a permanent place on the G20 for the African Union and it convened the Voice of the Global South Summit right at the beginning of India's G20 presidency to make sure the developing world's voice is heard. So I think India can help to, to take forward its development objectives with its partners in the, the so-called global south, but I think the UK could play a role in that as well. So I think my advice for people is to think long-term. That journey um, is always decades long and we should look at India in 2047 with that target of being a developed nation. I think there's a journey to be had there and I think the UK can play a role in that. And my other piece of advice is to think big you know, look for that global game changer in green tech, food tech or health tech that can tr transform lives and economies, not just UK and India, but across the developing world.
Thank you for that, Kevin. I think you very rightly addressed how important it is for uh, research institutions and universities and young people to collaborate between India and the UK to give rise to new ideas. And also, it is very interesting to know that UK IBC is trying to cover this in, in their business as well. Uh, so thank you for that. And I hope that whatever you spoke to us to, about today uh, goes on to encourage the youth, the policymakers, and the business leaders in both the countries, and also promotes a deeper understanding of trade relations. Uh, with this, I believe that we have come to the very end of our agenda for today and of a truly enlightening uh, discussion as well. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for your contributions and for your insights. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you, and we at the Geostrata hope to have you again with us very soon, possibly discussing things from a different viewpoint. And I also look forward to seeing any successes that might emerge from our collective effort today. And on a final note, I would like to uh, give a big thank you to our audience as well for tuning in. Thank you, Anmol. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you this morning. Take care.